Hi everyone, Chris Torres here from the Tourism Marketing Agency and welcome to another Digital Tourism Show. In this episode, filmed during a live Travel Massive event, I had the pleasure of speaking with Peter Troubles of Cultural Perspectives and he will be discussing the cultural perception of Glasgow and how that has changed over the years in the eyes of the international traveller. Peter shares his wealth of knowledge and experience in determining how Glasgow has changed from back in the 70s and 80s all the way through to our world famous Glasgow Garden Festival all the way through to the present day and how we will look at things beyond 2020. So this is a great one, a great episode for those who are interested in destination management and destination marketing. So please welcome Peter to the Digital Tourism Show episode 246. Hi, Peter. Hi, Chris. Thank you very much for the introduction. That's all right. How's things? How are you, how, how are you coping with uh, life in COVID? Well, like everybody, it's uh, um, strange times. And uh, I think when I first signed up to, to do this, that was about three or four months ago. And then shortly after that, things changed. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I think my, my views on the city have probably changed over the last three or four months in terms of where the city stands today and where it's going to go in the future and I maybe we'll talk a bit about that later on I think so definitely yeah I know as, as always with the last few online events we were hoping to do these in person with an audience um, but making the use of technology and doing we seem to be doing nothing but zoom meetings these days so, yeah. <laughs> so people are probably sick of the back teeth of them now but it's, it's great that we have this platform to do this yeah absolutely. so um so yeah so I, I I'm I'm at an age where I can remember Glasgow back when it was maybe it maybe have been seen to have a sort of less than savoury reputation and and not a city that someone would maybe call cultured or or anything like that. But so much has changed over the years. You can, everyone can see that in front of their eyes, you know, especially down the Clyde side and everything else. So, but um, and that's all, all been driven from pretty much the, as far as I'm concerned, the Glasgow um, Garden Festival back in I think it was 1988 that that was that happened. Yep. So in your eyes. Was that the, the catalyst and how do you see the, the city being perceived today and how important was that event for Glasgow back in the day? Um, well, I suppose I should quantify that by saying that I actually arrived in Glasgow um, in 1987. So I kind of arrived just as plans for the Garden Festival were, mm -hmm. were very much taking place. Um, it was certainly um, a very important event for the city, but I would argue that probably there was a couple of other significant events um, leading up to the Garden Festival that really helped to sort of, you know, oil the wheels to, to push Glasgow to where it is today. Um, I think one of those would almost certainly be the opening of the Barrel Collection, um, which for anybody who doesn't know Glasgow um, is a, a fantastic uh, five-star museum um, holding the works of uh, a former Glasgow shipping magnet, Sir William Burrell, who um, bequeathed his entire collection of some 8,000 five-star museum objects to Glasgow um, back in the middle years of the 20th century. He died, I think, about 1944, and he basically bequeathed his entire collection. And this is everything from sort of Chinese ceramics to um, uh, medieval kind of tapestries to suits of armor to um, right through to impressionist paintings. I mean, you're talking five star quality art objects. Mm -hmm. and he basically bequeathed the collection to the city of Glasgow together with a, a chunk of money for the city to, 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 buy, to build a new museum to house this collection. And for various reasons, mainly associated with the terms of the quest, um, it took Glasgow about sort of 30 years to to organize a, a new building and eventually um, uh, a site was identified and a new museum for the borough collection was um, was made available in Pollock Country Park um, which is to the, anybody who doesn't know Glasgow it's just to the south of the river um, and that building opened in 1983. Now um, that was probably I suppose what you probably see is the equivalent of of a Guggenheim opening a branch museum today or, you know, the Musée d'Orsay or the Pompidou. I mean, it was a, a really significant cultural event, you know, worldwide at that time. And the fact that it was Glasgow and nobody really thought of Glasgow as being, you know, 
kind of of that stature was mm -hmm. really a significant event for the city. And I mean, they they got something in I think in excess of a million visitors for the first couple of years. Which if you think about wow. the size of Glasgow, of what's Glasgow's population six hundred thousand or something. So I mean, mm -hmm. it was a significant event. And as I say, it came with a huge amount of media attention, um, which. It was probably the first big kind of cultural push that the Glasgow, you know, Glasgow had, had, mm -hmm. had sort of really benefited from, bearing in mind, you know, we're only 50 miles from Edinburgh with the festival and the fringe and all that sort of going on. So this was a really, really significant event for, for Glasgow at the time. So that's one one event that I, I see very much as a precursor to the Garden Festival. The other one, I suppose, and it's around about the same time, is, is the marketing campaign that was pushed forward by the then Lord Provost, Michael Kelly, which was, and some of, some of, people here today will know about it, the Glasgow Miles Better campaign. <laughs> I remember which, that. Um, yes. <laughs> remember that. It's um, it's based on a, a, a children's cartoon character, um, the Mr. Men series. And um, the marketing push was this big, bright, yellow, blobby character with the tagline, Glasgow's Miles Better. Um, and it, it, it grabbed the attention of people in Glasgow and people further afield. I mean, there was T-shirts and bumper stickers and all sorts of stuff. And it just, it won numerous marketing awards. And equally, it was designed in such a way that, although it was identified as Glasgow's miles better, depending where you put the apostrophe, it could be Glasgow smiles better. So yeah. the fact you had two taglines that you could benefit from. And this, it just grabbed people's attention, won loads of awards. And it was really the first attempt. It was an attempt by Glasgow to really to promote itself as a kind of tourist destination. I think they, they were looking across the M8 to Edinburgh and trying to get a piece of the action. And as I say, it was very much driven by the then Lord Provost. And as I say, it was it, was, it tagged along to the, the, the coattails of, of the success of the borough collection. And, you know, once again, on a worldwide stage, people suddenly got to hear about Glasgow. What is this about Glasgow? And I think the borough collection and the Mars Better campaign very much were the things that boosted the city's um, uh, submission to be a UK garden festival city, which was in 1988. And mm -hmm. previous cities that had been Stoke on Trent and Liverpool. And the whole idea was that these these garden festivals were sort of three or four months over the summer the idea was that if they would utilize elements of the city center that perhaps had been neglected um you know in stoke-on-trent it was the kind of potteries and liverpool it was the kind of the kind of the docks again and it was a huge success for glasgow it was down on the clyde side and if i remember rightly you might be able to tell me chris i think the weather was actually quite nice that summer and you know it, it, it just, was uh, if I, yeah it if I remember it. rightly, was it, was it not record, record breaking summer that we had or something it like that? It probably know? was. I mean, I think yeah. it kind of maybe looked through rose tinted glasses, but it was hugely successful. Um, yeah. And, you know, you had suddenly lots and lots of people coming to Glasgow because it was this garden festival year. Um, and then also benefited from going to see the Borough Collection. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was a, as I say, as you start off by saying, you know, it was probably the first big citywide event that really pushed Glasgow, mm -hmm. you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of cultural tourism tourism way and of course literally just a couple of years after that glasgow on the strength of the success of the garden festival and the barrel etc etc you know they, they threw the hat into the ring as, as being a european city of culture and of course they they were given that award which as the only well at the time it was the uk's first a successful nomination as a European city of culture. And of course, I think of all the things that Glasgow has done over the last sort of 30 years, it's that one year long event, the European city of culture 1990, which projected Glasgow's name on a global stage. Mm -hmm. um, a program event spread over 12 months, you know, five star names from Pavarotti, you know, Frank Sinatra, you know, community events, art exhibitions the works across the city mm -hmm. and I mean here we are now what 30 years on and I think people still come to me sometimes say yeah you know I knew Glasgow from the bad old days I came to mm -hmm. Glasgow because of 1990 you know and you know people still remember that one year-long event as being the real catalyst for perhaps where Glasgow is is today I mean yeah. I spent most I, mean, I hadn't been in Glasgow very long but I think I spent most of 1990 sort of dealing with press and media inquiries um, and one of the questions was you know how comes Glasgow has, has achieved this in such a short space of time because you know this was this was media attention that would not have been in Glasgow in 
1981 or 1982, yeah. and suddenly eight years later, you know, it, it, it's, it's, the city has a worldwide attention. So I think, you know, there's been sort of incremental steps, you know, um, leading up to Garden Festival and then European mm -hmm. City of Culture. And I would I would argue that probably, yeah, um, the city has has benefited undoubtedly from the success of that event 30 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, there's been other significant events that have gone on, maybe not to the same scale, but, you know, it's been incremental. Um, but, you yeah. know, Garden Festival, 1988, European City of Culture, 1990, they are the two key, two key events that I think really have pushed Glasgow where it is today. Mm -hmm. It's, it's amazing how, how much it changed, like so within the space of three or four years, whatever that was. It's just how, how, how the reputation changed of Glasgow. And you saying, oh, a million, a million people coming to the borough collection. That must have, <laughs> the city must have been chock a block back, <laughs> back then. Because I don't, I don't think we had as many hotels and accommodation places. Well, I think, I think in a sense, you know, it's chicken and egg because in a sense, yeah, mm -hmm. you, you've got this sudden influx of people coming to the city and, you know, you know, at the time, probably Glasgow didn't have enough hotels, and the whole hospitality side of things was wasn't as advanced. I can remember first coming to Glasgow, probably 1980, 1981, 1982, and you know, struggling to find accommodation because either there was either you know the Marriott or a Holiday Inn, or there was a B and B in in the West End, and that kind of middle middle ground, you know hadn't really been occupied then and you know, mm -hmm. obviously that's been a kind of incremental thing that you know hotels are now um dotted across the city but you know yeah you need the event to attract the public but then you you need to be guaranteed the public going to come and support the events anyway so it's yeah. um but that as i say I, I do think that's that's where you know where glasgow's subsequent success mm -hmm. ultimately emanates from mm -hmm. So I imagine because of that, that really grew, uh, and you sort of touched on it, really grew Glasgow's reputation internationally. Because did, did we have much of an international pool or, or market back back then before all this happened? Or, or uh, had, had that, now, and how is that like now in terms of international market? Well, I suppose, I suppose I could I could kind of classify my own kind of path to Glasgow as being a good example because probably mm -hmm. you know in the late nineteen seventies probably I would not have come to Glasgow. I did a master's degree at at St Andrews, um, mm -hmm. and then I moved into a job working at the Hunter and Art Gallery um, at the University of Glasgow before moving on to, to Glasgow School of Art. Um, now, whether those opportunities would have been there back in the 1970s, they may have been, but perhaps I would have been maybe less inclined to think of Glasgow as a as a place to start my, my career. Um, but I knew about, say, Borough Collection, you know, Mr. Happy, the Garden Festival, things like that really kind of, you know, in the back of my mind, I knew that, you know, Glasgow was probably going to go somewhere. Um, I didn't necessarily think I'd be staying in Glasgow for 30 years after that. But, you know, it was it was a good time for me to come to Glasgow because I thought, you know, the city was 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 going forward. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, the reputation of the city um, <clears throat> pre borough I mean, 1960s, 1970s, I mean, if for people who didn't know the city, I think there was very much a view that it was still post-industrial, which to a certain mm -hmm. extent it it was. Um, there were social problems, which of course there were, but you know most big cities had had social problems. So whether mm -hmm. those problems were were over egged um, as far as Glasgow's reputation was concerned, I, I don't know. But you know they were the kind of perceptions that a lot of people who didn't know the city had. Um, yeah. You know, the buildings, most of, the, most of Glasgow's finest buildings were still covered under a layer of soot and were blackened and probably weren't as you know, appealing and as attractive as, as they were once they'd been given a, a damn good clean. Um, I mean, you highlighted the fact that, you know, there were few hotels. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't seen probably as that kind of cultural destination, um, you know, as, as a, Marked earlier, and, and Paul will probably agree. You know, Edinburgh was was the place that you went to for, if you like, Scottish culture. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, Edinburgh had had forty years on Glasgow in terms of the origins of the Edinburgh Festival, etc. So, um, you know, I think there was a growing kind of perception that Glasgow needed to sort of try and get in on the action, um, and things like the borough were was was an attempt to sort of try and create a kind of a, a, a better balance between the two cities. Um, and I think probably, you know, in the to the 70s and um, probably up into the early 80s, I mean, the significance of Glasgow's architectural heritage 
and the strength of its civic collection. If you think about Kelvin Grove Art Gallery, which is the main yeah. civic collection. I mean, stunning, stunning collections that have been you know held by the city for a best part of a century. You know, um, now they're seen as, as as being as significant as any museum anywhere in the UK and even further afield. But you know. Mm -hmm. Back in the 1970s, unless you were really into it, you probably didn't really appreciate, you know, what Glasgow had on its on its yeah. you know, doorstep. I mean, you know, the, you kind of hear the stories of you know families going to the galleries on the on, the, on a Sunday afternoon. Well, that certainly was the case. I mean, Glasgow galleries being being thankfully free, but I think beyond the city boundaries, I think there was a kind of a general lack of awareness as to what the city really had to offer. Um, mm -hmm. Um, interestingly, coming from where where I've worked for the last sort of thirty years, the kind of the, the architectural heritage of, of Charles Rennie Mackintosh, um, you know, into the sort of early nineteen eighties, I mean, the city really kind of mostly ignored. I'm not saying ignored, but was unaware of the significance of Mackintosh's reputation on an international stage. Um, yet, the fact that the city contributed to um, a number of international exhibitions back in the in the 1970s, primarily 70s and early 80s, um, shows in Japan and, and, you know, exhibitions of Macintosh in Japan attracting thousands and thousands of people at a time when there had been an exhibition on Macintosh actually in the very city he was born. Um, so, you know, Glasgow was, was slightly behind the, the curve, if you like. And I think, as I've said earlier, you know, I think Things like the Garden Festival Cultural Cultural City Year in 1990 um, really started to sort of you know waken not only people locally within Scotland and internationally that you know Glasgow had been a bit of a sleeping giant um, and that you know it really had a stature that probably needed to be you know emphasised and shouted about mm -hmm. um, and as I say I think the bounce from um, European city of culture was was certainly one that certainly helped the city um over the last you know two or three two or three decades and recognition that you know the city's architecture is stunning um uh, uh and you know also that it now has um a nice kind of pool of new architecture that the, the, the city should be proud of things yeah. like the riverside museum with Peter deed even down to the hydro i mean uh, you know who would have thought that glasgow would have sustained a um an events venue with what was it, seating capacity of what 10, 12, 14,000. I mean, absolutely stunning and a remarkable building now that you know, when mm -hmm. floodlit is you know, is the equivalent of any major event. Yeah, it's apparently it's the yeah. second yeah. largest music venue or busiest music venue in Europe or something yeah. like that now, or yeah, something exactly. not the world, so it's incredible. Um, so. and I think the other the other event probably was back in 1990. Glasgow started really the first of what they called the Doors Open Day, which was a program of opening up. The city's buildings and buildings that would not normally be available to the public and there was this kind of an attempt once a year to try and get a lot of private building owners and businesses to open their doors to the public and glasgow was seen very much at the forefront of this program which is now rolled out across every every major city worldwide where um you know it's about trying to sort of you know showcase you know what's on your doorstep the bricks and mortar that you know yeah. are just around the corner and you know glasgow led the way on that and you know it's it's something that i think very much is is still seen as once again another example of glasgow you know bucking the trend and coming up with something new and different being very successful at home and it's been replicated and, and used elsewhere so yeah. I think you know the architecture is one thing. The other, the other thing I was thinking of was you know things like sporting events. I mean, you know we talked about culture, but you know Glasgow obviously with its kind of history in of football primarily. But I mean mm -hmm. things like the Commonwealth Games in 2014. I mean, who would have thought that Glasgow would have been in the running for such a hugely successful? Mm -hmm. um, it was such a great event as well, really good. Um, and then you know four years later, the European Championships, which which another another event that Glasgow seems to seems to have embraced. So I think, you know, sport and culture, they've just blossomed over, over over the years. And I think, you know, it's it's taken Glasgow's own people you know, to sort of embrace this and say, actually, yeah, we've got things to shout about. And I think the more yeah. that Glasgow shouted about it, you know, people beyond the city have also recognized there's things to yeah. to, to to be proud of. Um, so it's kind of a kind of a as I say, it's a kind of gradual thing, but it's kind of it's kind of it's captured people's attention over yeah. time. As I say, you know, internationally, now people do say, "Oh, well, you know, you know, there's more to there's more to 
to Scotland's culture than than the Edinburgh Festival. Um, yeah, I think that's that's been very important. And I think you know, mm -hmm. you know, the two are always going to be very different. But I think you know, Glasgow and Edinburgh can bounce off each other without a doubt. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And and, and do you, in fact, that sort of leads into my next question. Uh -huh. that one in terms of you no, know, usually when people come to Scotland, that you no, know, it's they think of either Edinburgh or something like that first because of the castle and everything else. But um, how do we make if it's not already starting to happen, how do we make Glasgow the the first city people think about to come here? Um, or do you actually see that happening now? Do you see sort of see people internationally or from other destinations coming uh, in the UK coming to Glasgow and think coming here first, spending time here rather than just coming here for a day visit and going back to Edinburgh or anything like that? How, how do you see that playing? Out? I think, in a sense, in some cases, it's kind of moved the other way. That certainly when you talk about you know people moving to Edinburgh, I think, you know, certainly during the mm -hmm. festival time that, you know, people tend to base themselves, a lot of people I know now from, from first-hand experience, you know, base themselves here in Glasgow um, and spend time in Glasgow. And then they'll go to Edinburgh to, in, mm -hmm. you know, to spend one or two days in Edinburgh. Whereas once again, 30, 40 years ago, you know, you would only probably get the hardened person who would basically be in Edinburgh for the festival. And they might venture mm -hmm. across to Glasgow for a few hours just to see what it was like, you know, the other side of the yeah. M8. Um, and that's kind of flipped up, you know, obviously, you know, there's probably better better and cheaper accommodation in Glasgow during the festival than you can get in, in Edinburgh. So that's obviously mm -hmm. that whole, but, you know, I, th I think that idea of, you know, Glasgow trying to sort of, you know, sell itself is, is already happening. I mean, I think, you know, I haven't got a castle, but that's not a problem. You know, if you want a castle, <laughs> Go, go somewhere else. I think different is yep. is good. Um, mm -hmm. The thing that a lot of my clients, people I've worked with over the years, have picked up on is, is the kind of the friendliness of, of the locals. Um, mm -hmm. You know, particularly if you know if they've come up from say London or you know places where perhaps there's not that sense of kind of community. They do feel there's a sense of community within Glasgow. Um, the other thing that people have picked up on and have said to me in the past is they quite like the fact that Glasgow's not overly touristy you know it's not you know there's not kind of pinch points and for many people that's quite appealing you know if you if you just come back from venice or dubrovnik or barcelona and you've just been swamped in every every turn you know there's another there's another you know, another tour group i think a lot of people quite like the fact that you know they can wander the streets of glasgow without feeling as if you know they're stuck in the midst of a you know of a of a kind of tourist kind of maelstrom um so i think that's something that has an, has an appeal. I think Glasgow does that very well. I think the other strong element that has, I think, an advantage for Glasgow is the proximity to the countryside. Um, mm. Certainly clients that I've taken um, um, over the years are staggered by the fact that they, you know, you can have the urban visit, you know, in the morning and then in the afternoon you can be on Loch Lomond side or up at the Trossachs or down yeah. to Arran and across to, you know, across to Arran. Um, mm. The fact that, you know, Glasgow, the gateway to Highlands and Islands, you know, it's a kind of, you know, you get a two in one experience. So, you know, many people like the, the urban experience, but actually are then really surprised that they, you know, they can add on a day or so. Um, so I think that very much has uh, an appeal. Um, the sort of specialist groups that I've dealt with over the years, kind of architectural kind of art history groups um, in the US, Australia, and really across Europe, you know, you know, they recognize the sort of the significance of Glasgow culture, the importance of its architecture, the importance of its museums and the new museums that have been built up in, in recent times, like Riverside. Um, so, I, you know, I think, um, you know, a lot of a lot of people that I deal with, you know, realize that Glasgow has, you know, just as good a cultural you know kind mm -hmm. of framework as as edinburgh or, you know or many yeah. other cities so I, you know i don't think necessarily glasgow is is losing out i think you know i think i mentioned before i think you know different is good mm -hmm. i mean um you know glasgow is never going to be edinburgh and edinburgh is never going to be glasgow um and i think you know each have got their appeal there are certain people i'm sure will choose to you know to vacation in in edinburgh and will think nothing of going anywhere else other than Edinburgh. Um, mm -hmm. And there are probably people who will choose to come to Glasgow, but probably would maybe would just dip into a day in Edinburgh because they don't want to be overrun by, you know, hundreds yeah. and hundreds of yeah. tour groups. So I think, you know, I think Glasgow is definitely holding its own. And I think, you know, I think the city really just has to play to its strengths mm -hmm. um, and yeah. carry on doing what it's been doing for the last 30 years. 
Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and the point that you made about being so close to Loch Lomond and all these other places, though, but where I live in Knightswood, which I'm literally a 10, 15 minute drive and I'm, and I'm there. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's not it's not that far away at all. It's, it's, it's incredible. That's what I love about Glasgow. Um, I, mean, I, but, I mean, you know, you, you can stop off in the distillery on, you know, you can literally paddle your you know feet in the in the waters mm-hmm. of Loch Lomond, stop off at the distillery on the way back and be be back in a, a city centre hotel in you know sort of fifty minutes, and for a lot of people yeah. they just can't believe. It. I think I think the size of Glasgow and Edinburgh as well, but I think the size of Glasgow means that that's doable. And you know you're not mm-hmm. having to spend you know an hour crossing through you know suburbs to get out of the city. So I think people are really surprised yeah. that you know that, you know literally ten minutes from George Square, you know you're out of the city. Um, mm-hmm. And I think for a lot of people that's really a, a surprise and a, a really nice surprise. Well, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So obviously with this video that we're doing in the podcast that, we'll, that goes out later, a lot of this is watched and listened by a lot of tourism businesses and operators, accommodation providers, etc. So what can they do? Um, and if they have a, an affinity with Glasgow, what can they do to raise, help raise Glasgow's profile further and, and make it a go-to destination? What would you, what would you say to them? Um, I, I think I said before, I think, you know, probably focus on what makes Glasgow unique. Um, you know, mm. Don't try and be something that it's not, you know. Don't try and pretend that you've got castles and tartan and all that sort of stuff because, you know, there are lots of other places that can do that and can do that better. So, you know, focus on – I've often thought about people and place, the, the place itself. So that's the sort of the bricks and mortar, you know, the architecture, you know, the, the ability to, you know, to, to see, you know, museums and, and culture, but also the people. Um, you know, people often talk about, you know, the friendliness of, of – of Scots in general, speaking as an Englishman, but you know the the, the friendlies of, of 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 the Scots and certainly of, of, of Glasgow. Um, so you know, focus on that. I mean, I think probably the kind of history of Glasgow is probably slightly underplayed at the moment um, because there's there's a lot of interest in sort of ancestral tourism and all sorts of stuff like that. The expat yeah. community. Um, just recently, there was a. a, a, a an architectural competition which was put forward by the Alexander Thompson Society to um, uh, Thompson's probably the other famous Glasgow architect if people don't haven't heard the name um, and there's a building in the city centre called the Egyptian Halls just across from the central station and it's it's a building at risk it's it's a significant building and it's been pretty much derelict for the last sort of 40 years and this competition was announced quite recently uh, a few months ago um, as to what to do with this building because there's a big debate about you know viability of it going forward we, the city doesn't want to lose it but doesn't want to do with it and believe it or not one of the things that came out of it was um, well, the winning winning um, proposal was it be turned into a Scottish museum of slavery which of course given recent the current, debate the current climate, yeah, yeah. and of course you know a lot of people probably are unaware that Glasgow's mm-hmm. success and, and wealth in the late um, 18th century, 17th, 18th, and into the early, well, certainly 18th century, um, was built on tobacco and cotton. Um, and of course, that obviously has connotations about whether that's good or bad, but, you know, it's here, it's part of Glasgow's history. Um, and probably it's something that, you know, the city probably could do more to sort of make of its of its of its yeah, past. We I agree. Think I think, I think it's a, a relief. Yeah. We tend I to think, think of Glasgow as a kind of, of a Victorian city, but you know mm-hmm. the, the success of Glasgow in the late nineteenth century was built on what happened a hundred years earlier. So mm-hmm. I think the history yeah. is is one thing that probably the city could do more in terms of mm-hmm. promoting. And I suppose the other thing, which is kind of a bit of bugbear of mine, is is to make better use of the River Clyde. Um, you know, when before I came to Glasgow, you know, I knew of the River Clyde, you know, um, mm-hmm. as of the River Mersey and the River Thames, etc. It was, you know, one of the things that was associated with Glasgow shipbuilding. Um, and here we are, you know, I've been in Glasgow now for what, 33, 34 years, and I don't see a huge amount of kind of, um, you know, kind of additional kind of use of what is, mm-hmm. you know, something that's been. <laughs> been with the city forever um and yeah. a lot of people i know you know can't quite get their heads around that we've got this fantastic resource flowing through the city and yet somehow the city seems to have overlooked it you know we've got a wonderful yeah. heritage center down in govern the fairfield heritage center um but it's in govern which is for people who don't know listening now i mean it's only about sort of four or five miles from the city center um and it tells the story of one of the most significant shipping companies in, in glasgow and the only way you can't get to 
Fairfield Heritage Centre is by river. You've got to go by underground or bus or taxi or car uh, mm -hmm. and get this right on the riverside. And, um, you know, I can't, still can't, I mean, I understand it's a really complex issue about how you, how you address, you know, kind of riverside. But I think going back to how we started this conversation, Chris, about the Garden Festival, the whole idea with the Garden Festival was it, it utilised mm -hmm. up until then a very large area of derelict land on the banks of the River Clyde. And I think back then in 1988, it was seen as, as the catalyst to really develop and, 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 and yeah. make use of the riverfront that, you know, stretches from mm. Glasgow City Centre right out to Greenock and Gurk. Mm. And yet here we are 30, 30 plus years on, and I don't quite see the kind of joined upness that perhaps people had hoped would, would, would take place. So, mm. you know, once again, people coming into Glasgow, you know, they, they can't, can't quite believe that the city's not really using the waterfront as, mm. as, as, perhaps it, as, as perhaps it should. And there was obviously good examples of where you know, Liverpool and Belfast have really taken a, a, a grip of, of their harbour front and even with Dundee now with the V&A. Um, so, uh, you know, going ahead, you know, try and maintain that status. I think really the city does need to look at, at how it how it addresses its river frontage um, mm -hmm. and perhaps some of the history that, you know, say, the earlier history that perhaps fewer people know about. Yeah, no, I can't. I can't agree more. I, th I think the, the river should be used more. I, I would love to see that being used more. But as you say, it's such a great resource, and you don't really see much happening with it. Um, so no, I can't agree with you more. So, and, and before we go into the last question, um, and, and then move on to any questions from from the, the, the listeners and the watchers, um, what do you see uh, in Glasgow's future? How do you see Glasgow progressing? Um, not, now post COVID, in terms of what's going to happen with that, but. Um, how, how do you see us growing uh, in terms internationally or in terms of driving more tourists uh, and more visitors to Glasgow? And um, what do you see as in our future? Um, difficult, I think. I mean, obviously, when we talked about doing this presentation, you know, it was pre-COVID and things were looking good, yeah. and you know, the city was, you know, was a buzz, and you know, um, I mean, I, I had a wander through the, the city centre for the first time in what three months, just last week, and it suddenly dawned on me how many hotels the city has and you kind of think wait a minute how are they all going to you know survive going forward i mean Re recently built as well <laughs> well i'm going to say that the, the, there's a new premier inn being developed down at um, mm. scenic uh, square and then there's a, a new um, planning proposal for another multi-story hotel just off bar street and you kind of think mm, i wonder how you know and obviously i don't think yeah. glasgow is going to be alone in that i think every major city is going to have that sort of concern um mm. i mean has Glasgow had an over-reliance perhaps on sort of hospitality, you know, the idea that you come to Glasgow for short, you know, short weekend shopping breaks, the hospitality restaurant business, you know, the big corporate events, um, concerts at the Hydro. I mean, I'm hearing rumours that the Hydro is not going to possibly reopen until 2021. And, you know, I was trying to get my head around thinking, well, if, if the Hydro has, say, three events a week and there's about 14,000 capacity, you know, that's 40,000 plus people are coming to one venue each week and they're not going to have any business for nine months. And you kind of think how much of that business is going to have an implication on yeah. hotel occupancy, restaurant business, taxis, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, how does Glasgow really sort of, um, you know, pick up from such a huge potential gap? And, you know, mm. perhaps there is a need to, to, to diversify. I don't quite know how how that's achievable but maybe you know we need to look and it's obviously not something that's going to happen overnight but depending on how long the kind of the ramifications of covid are with us um you know maybe the whole idea that you know people gather you know in tens of thousands in in big events sporting events as well so maybe we need to think about being maybe slightly smaller slightly more specialized um you know maybe as I said before, focus on the things that, you know, that that the city will still have in 10, 20, 50 years time. So, you know, the buildings, its museums, assuming they're still going to be funded, um, the people that make the city, um, you know, the river, um, and perhaps move away from, in some, sh some shape or form, move away from the kind of reliance on, yeah, the hospitality sector, which perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, most most cities have obviously picked up on, and I don't think obviously the issues that face Glasgow are going to be any different from 
you know, yeah. Singapore or you know, Dubai or whatever, where, wherever that that sort of new trend over the last 10, 20 years has sort of gathered pace. Um, I think the response from each of those cities is going to have to be different. You're going to have to always go back to basics and say, you know, what yeah. what makes Glasgow stand out different from 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 you know Edinburgh or Stirling or London or Leeds or Manchester or Paris or Brussels, um, and you know, I don't think it's going to be an easy solution. But I, I do think probably you know um, cities are going to have to to really diversify and look at what makes them unique. Um, and you know that's going to be a difficult task, and it's going to involve a lot of diverse organisations and, and a commitment from multiple players. Um, and as I say, you know, 50 miles down the road from here, you know, Edinburgh are going to be facing exactly the same issue. You know, you're not going to get, you know, tens of thousands of you know Chinese visitors primarily at the moment, you know, descending on the city. Um, so how do, how do they address you know the, sh the shortfall? Um, I mean, it's not my it's not my bag. I mean, I, I I'm the last person to really sort of give any pointers. But I mean, I other than the fact that I do know that you know it is it is going to be difficult. I mean, I, I mean, once again, I suppose given the kind of area of my interest and the sort of specialist groups and the people I kind of I mix with, then they are probably still going to come to Glasgow. But, you know, they are relatively small in number. Um, you know, my new business very much is targeted towards, mm -hmm. you know, cultural tours, bespoke cultural tours, small groups, you know, behind the scenes, access to buildings and museums. Um, so, you know, they probably will still be okay. Um, but you know, in the in the bigger picture, the numbers of people that people like myself are going to be able to sort of um, deliver to Glasgow is still going to be relatively small, and I don't quite know how you know the city plugs the bigger gap. Um, and so, mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not the best person to ask about that. But. Yeah, but difficult times. But no, ahead. Yeah, for sure. And as you say, it's not just going to affect Glasgow; it's going to affect everyone else. But. Um, so I'm looking at the, the little list to see if there's any questions come in. There is one, uh, which I think we're pretty much answered, but I'll show it on the screen anyway, because you want to add to it quickly, um, from, from Linda. Um, it's, a, it's a big question. Uh, what's the history of the rise of Glasgow's popularity as a destination for international travel? So we've pretty much covered a lot of that already, but just in case there was anything else you wanted to add, add to suppose, that before we finish. Once again, I'm not really the best person, but I suppose the... Mm -hmm. the, the um the rise of kind of direct flights into Glasgow. I mean, when I first moved to Glasgow, I mean, you know, you could get a flight to London and you could get a holiday destination to, you know, Malaga or, you know, Alicante, and that, that was about it. And mm -hmm. I think certainly um, Glasgow continues to benefit, I think, from the, the North Atlantic, well, pre-COVID, it, it benefit, benefits still from, you know, a North Atlantic um, market, uh, North American market. Um, uh, mentioned sort of the expat community i think you know the canadian connection is, is really important and i think you know as those connections sort of increase then i think you know that helped to sort of promote glasgow's popularity it's a bit chicken and egg because as i say you can you can wave the flag and say you know come to glasgow but if you don't have the travel connections you don't have the, the hotels etc cetera, etc cetera, you're not going to attract people but on the other hand mm -hmm. airlines are not going to come in until they're sure that there's things that their customers want to to see so um yeah i'd hop back to the fact that yeah it's 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 the nine late mid 1980s is really the kind of the key where you know glasgow sort of wakes up and says you know yeah we need to shout about ourselves you know we've been in the in the shadow of edinburgh and mm -hmm. sterling and other places for too long and you know glasgow's glasgow's got stuff that it should be proud of and we're going to really yeah. going to fight our corner and i think you know mm -hmm. that that's very much where 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 glasgow sort of um mm -hmm. His, his, his current success came from. Yeah. Got one more question and then we'll, we'll stop there. Um, it's coming from Tim. Uh, have you seen much, and obviously with the last few weeks, have you seen much innovation in the last few months uh, in terms of what's happened with Quasi? Um, not necessarily. Once again, it's not really sort of my bag. I mean, I'm sort of mm -hmm. kind of still talking to kind of groups of people who, you know, were intending on the two kind of um, specialist groups coming in from Australia and, and they were they were already talking about sort of 2021 anyway. So I'm hoping that, you know, they are still going to, you know, want to head this way. I mean, and once again, it's, mine's a kind of face-to-face -face business. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going down the technology route. I mean, for me, mm -hmm. it's very much about, you know, a, not quite a one-to-one, -one, but, you know, 
it's groups of maybe you know ten or fifteen tops, um, and you know I've, I've taken even groups of you know four and four and five people around the city. So it's that kind of that intimacy that that really um, is kind of my strength, um, mm -hmm. and therefore you know I'm hoping that that you know people will be avoiding the big groups and the big crowds, and therefore you know that sort of market for me will still be there. Um, I'm probably not the best person to sort of to to argue about that. I mean. When you say innovation, whether it's technology or you know promotion, I don't know. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm sort of sitting here, kind of constantly, kind of looking at what's coming out from you know Visit Scotland and you know UK inbounds and all these other kind of um, agencies that very much are at the sort of top of the tree and and just looking to see how how what they say and do and their predictions how that's going to ultimately trickle down to someone like myself. Mm -hmm. Well, Peter, I can't thank you enough. Um, some of that information and insights was incredible. Things that I never even knew about with Burrow Collection and everything else. That's That was fantastic. So uh, if anyone wanted to know more about you and what you do in your business, how would they get in touch with you? Um, my business, I set up a new business um, just about a year ago. It's called Cultural Perspectives. Um, uh, and I have a website and I have a LinkedIn profile as well. My surname is very unusual. So if I think you go into LinkedIn, I think there's any other one, Peter Trells on, on the entire um, network. So um, I'm an easy person to find on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, website, uh, culturalperspectives.co.uk. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm open to accommodating um, groups coming to Glasgow and Scotland at large, but I also um, um, programming uh, small specialist tours into European destinations such as Brussels, Barcelona, Budapest, focusing on, on mainly architecture, Art Nouveau architecture. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that, it will be sort of behind the scenes access, access to curators, uh, private collectors, mm -hmm. so it's the type of things that other you know, group tours won't get access to because I've worked for yeah. 20 plus years with the whole network of European um, colleagues, um, mainly around Art Nouveau and Art Deco. Um, so I can literally just kind of, you know, send off an email to someone and they can give me access to, to you know, buildings and collections that I would say 99% of other mm -hmm. tour operators can't get access to. So you're getting something bespoke and unique with me. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Well, Peter, thanks again. Uh, I can't thank you enough. And um, we'll hopefully see you at the end of this. Yeah. Maybe yeah, thanks thanks to you. And, uh, okay. But thank you, Peter. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.